Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hindsight Upfront, Implications of the Afghanistan Withdrawal for the Middle East and North Africa region. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we're truly looking forward to this um, expert panel discussion. Uh, we are very pleased to be welcoming Ambassador Mark Green, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, to uh, give us opening remarks. Ambassador Green. Thanks, Marissa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wilson Center. Our mission, in the words of our official congressional charter, is strengthening the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. There are few foreign policy topics more in need of that world of learning than the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, which is why we launched a series of discussions we call Hindsight Upfront. We began our series in August, first in a conversation with General David Petraeus and Sir John Scarlett, and then one with retired general and former national security advisor, H.R. McMaster. We then looked at the implications of the withdrawal for South Asia and then China and Russia, all featuring discussions with leading analysts on those regions. We then turned to a discussion on what lies ahead for U.S. policy in the future of Afghanistan, featuring a number of former senior officials with deep experience on this front. You could see a range of these materials from these events and other aspects of U.S. policy in Afghanistan by going to the Hindsight Upfront website, afghanistan.wilsoncenter.org. We're far from finished, though, which brings us to today and this discussion on the implications of the withdrawal and the Taliban takeover for the Middle East. Why the Middle East? Because at least for now, the Biden administration sees the region as a launching pad for what it calls over-the-horizon counterterrorism activities because two of the three countries that recognize the Taliban government during the 1990s are in the region. Because the Middle East is home to a variety of Islamist terrorist groups that are likely to have been emboldened and energized by the Taliban takeover. Many fear that the withdrawal may have questions, created questions in the minds of some about US military and diplomatic staying power in the region. Others are worried about its implications for human rights and democracy promotion not just in Afghanistan, but elsewhere. That's a lot to discuss and unpack. We have a great panel of experts today, all of whom are currently with or previously were with the Wilson Center. They'll help us all gain some hindsight up front. I'm looking forward to today's discussion. And so Marissa, back to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Green, for um, your introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be moderating this session today that we at MEP are co-hosting with the Asia program. Our expert panelists this morning include um, MEP Chair Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, um, former Wilson Public Policy Fellow and currently Director of Global Engagement at the American University of Beirut, Rami Khoury, um, and last but not least, our colleague um, um, here at MEP, the MEP fellow, Nadia uh, Oedat. All three speakers have diverse expertise in the region and will weigh on um, on the questions that Ambassador Green highlighted, starting with the how. How um, have events in Afghanistan, um, the, US the US withdrawal, um, the speedy takeover of the Taliban, um, uh, but also continuous developments today, um, how are these developments affecting the um, Middle East and North Africa region? There are certainly different dimensions to this, uh, to these implications on the security and military fronts that Ambassador Green mentioned, but also equally important on the political, socioeconomic and sociocultural fronts as well. And beyond the headlines um, that have uh, transpired and continue to develop in Afghanistan, Many analysts, columnists, and commentators from the region that we follow on a regular basis had already been signaling concerns about what the U.S. withdrawal means for the region, how will governments now work, choose to work or not choose to work with the Taliban-led government. Some are questioning um, their country's partnership with the United States or U.S. commitment to their secur security, but also to human development, to democracy, and to human rights. Um, there are certainly lots of questions and dimensions to explore. Before we kick off this uh, discussion, I just want to remind all of you watching today to please email uh, your questions to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet your questions to at Asia program. Rami, I'm going to start 
with you to give us the, the perspective um, from the region. How do you think developments in Afghanistan have played out or continue to play out in the, in the MENA region? Um, what were reactions, uh, not only from governments, but, but from others in, in civil society um, and just society at large? Uh, I'm happy to be with you all again. Um, my impression, frankly, based on living and working in the Middle East for the last half a century, since I got out of college in the early 70s, um, is that the Afghanistan situation, both the war and the American NATO withdrawal, uh, have been highly exaggerated in the Western world, especially in the United States, for understandable reasons. This was a traumatic uh, experience at some level for the United States. It was a strategic a mishap at, at some level, and American senior military and political people have mentioned this. If you look at this from the region, which is what I advocate, uh, you see that the Afghanistan situation and the American pullout uh, as uh, slightly marginal issues, uh, not totally marginal, but slightly marginal. When you look at the complete American military presence uh, in the region, I, I, it, the figures keep changing, 60, 70 bases, whatever the U.S., has out of something like 800 all around the world. Um, it's, a minor, uh, it's a minor shift. The, um, the strategy of fighting terrorism, the counterterrorism strategy um, over the last 20 years uh, has been a, a limited success. It's protected the US from a major strike, but it has uh, only seen the terror groups expand uh, as everybody agrees is happening all over the region. And if you look at the situation from the region, I think there are three or four important uh, factors. One is that the entire Middle East or West Asia region, Middle East, North Africa, is in great flux, uh, strategic, political, economic, social um, uh, relationships, everything is, uh, is moving. Um, it's all in motion. Most people are following strategies of strategic expedience. Uh, people will change their relationships. If you look at Turkey, Egypt, Qatar, the UAE, Iran, Saudi Arabia, they're all, you know, it's like musical chairs. They're, they're, they're realistic. They understand that the world is evolving. Uh, the US pullout out of Afghanistan may signal to many that the US is not a reliable long-term ally or that military power, much as the US and Israel have had that advantage in the region, is not gonna solve any of the big problems. So therefore people are moving around, looking for relationships that are more uh, useful uh, to them. The U.S. remains a huge military actor in the region. Uh, people understand that. They also uh, are concerned, I think, largely that this over-the-horizon counterterrorism strategy uh, is a recipe for colossal failure in the long run because it hasn't really worked. It hasn't worked for the last 20, uh, 30 years. And the missing element is the uh, condition, the socioeconomic political condition of the vast majority of people in the Middle East, especially the Arab world, where the, in the Arab world, which I know best, is something like 450 million people. About 75, 80% of them are poor and vulnerable, according to UN uh, data. The, the limited democratic openings that happened in Sudan and Tunisia uh, at some point in Lebanon, a little bit in Palestine, a little bit in Jordan, have all closed in the last two years. Um, and autocracy is on the march, and most of the autocrats are supported by Western European or Russian or Turkish or American uh, uh, policy. So that's the view from within the region. There's great concern about the stability, the, um, uh, the fragility of countries, and we see many countries that are, that are fragmenting and, and uh, dividing, falling apart, people breaking off like the Kurds in the north of, of, of Iraq, the South Sudan and uh, other areas. So I think a view from the region would suggest that the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan will have very limited impact on a region that was already in the midst of immense strategic repositioning, realignment, uh, as people search for somebody to help them stay in power or uh, stay relevant. The one thing that nobody has looked at seriously, and certainly not the US or the Europeans or the Russians, is the uh, social, economic, and political rights of the ordinary Arab citizen, or the Turk, or the Iranian, or, uh, or others. So this is the real point, I think, that we have to look at. Why are we having such immense uh, um, 
a turmoil, uh, or if not turmoil, turbulence in the region uh, at the level of economies, uh, strategic relationships, and others, and the immense growth of armed non-state actors, all of which are somehow linked to external states, including the U.S. helping some of the people in northern Syria and other places. So, uh, and finally, the immense weight of nonstop Arab autocracy, growing Arab autocracy for the last 40 years. And that's probably, in, at my, in my view, the foundation of all of our problems is uh, massive misgovernance by autocratic, usually military coup people supported by external powers. Uh, and I said, the US isn't the only culprit, uh, but also leading to the economic uh, debilitating situation, which creates mass desperation and fear, and therefore opens the door to external interventions. Uh, and lastly, we've had nonstop foreign military intervention in the Arab region since Napoleon. That's over 230 years ago. And it's still going, in fact, it's increasing in many ways using drones and other things. So these are the wider issues that we have to put together. The, the last point I make is that the, on the positive side, the vast majority of people in the Middle East want to have good relations with the US, with Europe. They want democratic societies. They want pluralism. They want accountability. They want human rights uh, 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 systems. We know that it's clear now, it's uh, uh, very obvious. And, and, and we should look at those combination of things together to really have a better view of what may be coming next. Thank you so much, um, Rami. You really did uh, sort of look at the wide spectrum of issues and highlighted the human factor, the human development factor um, in particular. And, and that's a perfect segue to, to, uh, to tap Nadia given um, her research and focus on um, um, activists in the region. Um, so um, I'd like to turn this to you to, to just give us a little bit um, of an in-depth view of how you think the developments in Afghanistan are gonna, going to affect um, that particular um, sector you know, in, um, in the region, um, those who have been fighting for human rights, um, education um, for all, particularly women, um, uh, but also, you know, tackling the root causes or the drivers of, uh, of violent extremism. Um, and then we will, we will get to um, the political and security dimension, but go ahead, Nadia. Uh, thank you so much for having me, uh, Marissa. So following up on what Rami said, which is that people in the region want democratic governments. They want accountability. They want universal human rights. Western governments pay a lot of lip service to the importance of these values. But I am not sure as somebody who researches the desires and initiatives of a lot of young people to try to get there. I'm not sure there's enough investment in fact to really translate these desires, this activism into, uh, into a reality on the ground. So what can we do? What, are we, what, are, what can we do and how do we look at this to actually make a difference a decade from now? So one thing that is, that is in our favor, actually a few things. One is, again, Rami mentioned that the region is in flux. So what we do now can make an enormous difference. We cannot just watch authoritarian powers provide millions, if not billions, in support of dictators and authoritarian governments, authoritarian ideas. And we just watch and, and hope for democracy to have a chance. We can't do that. We have to support our ideals like they support theirs. So how does this look like? What can we do? So one, missed, um, one way that we didn't go about it right is that this is about strengthening civil society. This is about equipping this activist civil society with the skill set to actually have these norms on the ground. But this conversation is not a government civil society conversation. It is actually a conversation between two civil societies, between Western civil society and civil society in the globe. Their goals are the same. And in fact, civil society in Western countries They've made enormous progress in diversity, in racial issues, in equality between men and women, in accountability in government. So this is a job, in fact, for civil society in countries that are free to operate and civil societies in places that are not yet, you know, have that space. So in places like, for example, in Egypt, civil society was completely shut down with CC, completely. So why, why is it shut down? 
because it's very effective because it can make a difference on the ground. So authoritarian regimes recognize the power of civil society and the power of culture, which is why they make sure that these spaces don't exist. So one thing that is also working in our favor, we just had a whole year plus of digital learning. So we, I had to teach you know, graduate students, undergrads using digital spaces. So we do have these spaces and I, I don't think we're using them enough to actually help in that, in furthering these values, in, in teaching real uh, skills on how to create civil society, how, how to have accountable governments, how to, I mean, especially they really needed these skill sets because we've never had years or decades of actual democratic rule, sharing of power, equal citizenship, all of these values, all of these building blocks for liberal democracies, we've never had them. So we actually, civil society in, in these countries, they need that skill set. So we're talking about Afghanistan. So right now, for example, there are hundreds of thousands of Afghanis that are outside Afghanistan. Many of them would love to play a role in doing something for their countries. I, I just met uh, at, a, at a talk I gave at George Mason, this brilliant young man uh, who really, you know, who he wants to, to basically explore what can we do to help uh, counter authoritarianism in Afghanistan and beyond. So these young people, and young and old, I don't want to discount the wisdom of people who've, who've you know, been around the block. How can we basically enable them to make a difference? Again, civil society to civil society, not government to civil society, not CIA to civil society, because I know this is a very sensitive issue. And um, uh, finally, giving, giving that what happens in any one place impacts everywhere. The Middle East has seen multiple iterations of an Islamic state. They've seen ISIS, they've seen Muslim Brotherhood, they've seen Iran, they've seen all sorts of uh, Islamic states, and not one of them is conducive to human rights. Not one of them is, is offering real solutions. They claim to be superior. They claim to have moral superiority, but in fact, they are mediocre they can only prevail by force, intimidation, and abusing human rights. So I really believe that the Taliban is reinforcing the message that political Islam, Islamist governments, are incapable of actually addressing the real problems of unemployment, governance, economic, economic prosperity. I mean, the Taliban, yes, what an empty victory when the country is entirely dependent upon aid. They are, they just, deactivated half the population, the women, they're not, they're not able to participate in the economy. So this will only drive further the notion that this is not where the solution is. They are actually slowly but surely making sure that this idea of an Islamic state rather than a democratic one is defeated once and for all, one Islamic state at a time. And I'll just stop here. Uh, thank you so much, um, Nadia. This is a, um, a very interesting sort of way to look at the implications on the region because I sort of feel that there's a little bit more hope that the region will, particularly the focus on civil society, that um, they will continue the work despite what happened. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and that instead of empowering Islamist groups, it might actually sort of push people away from you know, Islamist thinkings or support for Islamist led governments. Um, and um, that's also a, a perfect segue to um, Ambassador Jeffrey to focus on um, the security and political dimensions as well. Um, first of all, in reaction to, to both Rami um, and Nadia and their focus on the, um, on the human development factor, um, how do you think uh, events in the region have, I mean, Rami already mentioned it sort of, you know, um, led many governments to question U.S. commitment to their own security, uh, but also to those activists and, 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 you know, youth and others on the ground who are uh, trying to make a difference. You're on you, Jim. Thank you, Marissa, and it's good to be here uh, following up on Rami and Nadia uh, as best I can. Uh, 
what I want to do in response to Melissa's question is to go back to Max, uh, essentially for potential impacts, particularly in the Middle East, but not just there, uh, counterterrorism, uh, the American military presence, credibility, capabilities, uh, and then more broadly, uh, engagement to advance values, both generally and with a military um, focus. Uh, but first, a couple of general points that go beyond the Middle East, but are applicable to there. This is a failure, first of all. It's the biggest failure uh, that Washington has seen since Vietnam. Secondly, it is not unlike Vietnam and unlike the half a one third or two thirds failure of Iraq. This is not just a failure of the United States, it's a failure of the West because Europe was at least as committed in some respects, more committed to what we were trying to do in uh, Afghanistan. And up until the end had a very big role in how we would go about doing it. Now, this is very important for the entire world. What I'm gonna say will be controversial, but I spent my whole lifetime uh, seeing this in operation and I believe it's true. Since World War II, that's almost 80 years ago, uh, the major and primary fact of international life has been a global system whose core is global collective security run by the United States with close uh, and intimate support by Western Europe and other levels of support by Eastern Asian and other countries that again uh, has determined, has largely kept the world from a massive war. Anybody in the Middle East would say, wait a second, what about us? I'm talking about wars like World War I and World War II, which involved not only the Middle East dramatically, but the whole rest of the world, uh, and has also been a purveyor of various values, economic, monetary, cultural, uh, and so forth. That system took a blow with Afghanistan and uh, we all have to deal with it because most everybody is in the system or in the case of uh, China and Russia, uh, attempting to work around outside or undermine the system. But the system is a primordial uh, issue in international relations. Uh, so that's the general uh, overview. In terms of the four questions to the Middle East, let's start with terrorism. And we've actually got some good ideas from both Nadia and Rami. Uh, the counterterrorism operation in Afghanistan failed because we got confused between an indigenous revolution or insurgent force, the Taliban, which had very significant um, uh, popular support or at least popular acceptance, uh, and who used terrorist uh, tactics, terrorist actions uh, with pure counterterrorism, which began with Al Qaeda and later involved the Islamic State. That didn't work out. Uh, at the same time, we've just completed, we haven't completed, but we've done very well in dealing with, uh, Nadia mentioned it, the Islamic State since 2014. And there were different rules. First of all, in the places where we've had a few forces on the ground, uh, what we've seen is either a rejection of the Islamic State by local populations, those are the Kurds of Northeast Syria and Northern Iraq and the Shia Arabs of Iraq, and a partial rejection, partial uh, growing intolerance when the, the Islamic State took over of what they wanted, here uh, Nadia was very eloquent, among the Sunni Arab populations uh, in Western Iraq and along the Euphrates and Northeast um, Syria. And that is a model of a good, uh, almost Colin Powell, Powell doctrine, uh, counterterrorism operation. We had a very small footprint, so we weren't, as General Abizé, who knows the region well, used to say, uh, we weren't creating antibodies. We were letting local people do this. We weren't dictating their whole culture and politics and governance like I was doing in Iraq in 2004. We were basically saying, hey, we're here to help you rid yourself of the Taliban and maybe we'll rebuild uh, some of the schools and wells afterwards, but it doesn't go beyond that. Uh, and uh, that's been quite successful. Interestingly, where uh, the terrorist threat 
in Syria, I mean, the ISIS Islamic State threat remains the greatest, is in those parts of Syria where there is a very unpopular government that oppresses the primary ethnic group, the Sunni Arabs, that is in the rest of Syria, not the Northeast, where the Islamic State is still, believe me, flourishing. And so there's a lesson here for how we conduct counterterrorism operations in the broader Middle East, which includes but goes beyond the Arab world. Uh, next, uh, the American military presence. And here, Rami summed it up. He's right. Look, I, I do this for a living and have been doing it for a living. I can't keep track of the number, how many tens of thousands of American troops in the region, how many submarines and aircraft carriers. There's a lot. They're in about 12 countries of the region. Uh, there is very strong muscle movement signaling by this administration that there's not going to be any significant withdrawal from the region. So in that sense, despite the talk of pivots to Asia, which is real and important, uh, the Middle East remains important, and that includes important from a military standpoint, because there are major challenges from terrorism, from Iran, I think, uh, to some degree from Russia in certain areas where there is chaos. Syria is a chaotic example. Libya is another chaotic example that tends to attract the Russians, uh, where there is a, a requirement for that. There's a related question, however, which is the capabilities and the competence of that American military presence. And that has taken a real hit with uh, the uh, experience in Afghanistan, just like uh, the uh, competence and capabilities of the American military in fighting the Islamic State once the Obama administration got serious about it in 2015 uh, goes to our favor. So it's kind of a glass half empty uh, half uh, 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 whole. The other two areas are of some interest because they were addressed in detail by Nadia and Rami, and that is the underlying values and such. Uh, I can say, because I was involved in this at the beginning in the Balkans, that the model of the United States with the West, because that was the case in the Balkans as well as in Afghanistan, leading a multinational coalition through military action against one part of a population whose values we despise in order to advance values we believe are correct and values we believe are universal and values we believe that the majority of the population A, believes in or should believe in and B, will fight for. Uh, that whole concept, which began to a limited degree in Bosnia and then Kosovo is dead. It's not going to happen. The militaries have been so burnt by that experience, beginning with the American military, but I know others that, uh, particularly, for example, the German military, uh, the French military, the British military, uh, you are not going to see any support. The kind of fierce resistance we're getting from Colin Powell, much in the news recently with his death, to some of our adventures in the 1990s, you're going to see that 10 times. Uh, in the future. The final question, and perhaps in some respects, the most important one is, what about American sponsorship of the, these values? If not by military means, by, as Nadia said, by reaching out to the populations, by economic actions, by setting a good example, by putting pressure on those who reject these values in non-military ways, that, I think, will continue. How successful it will be, we don't know. We've got another example just before us right now with Sudan, another on the border. Well, actually, it is in the Arab <clears throat> League, so therefore we can uh, count it uh, as part of the broader Middle East. So uh, let's see. The jury is still out on that one. On the others, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, we can come to at least uh, preliminary conclusions on where the United States and its partners and allies are going to be going, at least as pertains to this region. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey. Uh, Nadia, I'll, I'll get to you in a minute, but there, there's um, a, a lot there to unpack and I guess try to also bring the conversation to other questions that popped up as all of you were speaking. Um, one thing that, um, that we had discussed also uh, briefly and that I heard from, from the three of you um, 
With regards to um, a, a shift in, in um, US foreign policy in the region or the approach at least beyond just the military and perhaps looking at security or using other tools in the, in the toolbox to advance US um, interests and particularly security in the region. Um, do you think that this will happen given this by the Biden administration is at least you know, more serious than the previous one um, about human rights and, and democracy. What does this sudden withdrawal mean for this particular agenda? And will we be seeing more regionalism? And by that, I mean more regional approaches, sort of solutions from within that only need some support, but not sort of an overall program that needs to be unfolded. Um, Rami, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. And then, and then Nadia, I know you have a few thoughts. You want me to go first? Okay, uh, thank you so much. That was, uh, those were two really great presentations which touched on so many points and I think clarified the nuances and complexities of all the things that are going on in the region and vis-a-vis -vis links with foreign powers. The critical thing I think for us to do, I'll answer, I'll give me a minute and then I'll get the event. The critical thing is to look at the Middle East, uh, and I know this is hard to do in Washington, but to look at the Middle East, not from an American or NATO perspective only, that's natural, but you've got to really look at it in terms of the Middle East's own perceptions and relationships with powers all over the world. And we're talking of big powers like the Russians who are now actively involved, the Europeans, uh, the French and British particularly, who are actively involved in warfare, and the Americans, of course, but also the, the Chinese and the Japanese and their economic links. When you took, look at the world from within the Middle East, you see a very different picture. Uh, and also keep in mind that polling evidence, which we now have heavily for the last 20 years, repeatedly shows that the average ordinary person in the Arab world sees the US and Israel as their biggest security threat. And that changes a little bit, but it's always number one and two. Uh, some people see Iran, some people see others. Uh, so I think then we need a more comprehensive and accurate view of the relationships between uh, US foreign policy, counterterrorism policy, uh, values promotion and, uh, and the region. It's interesting that uh, Israel and oil, which historically were the main reasons for the U.S. to do what it does in the region, aren't that big an issue anymore. Israel is so strong it can protect itself. The U.S. has committed by law to keep Israel stronger than any combination of its foes in the region, Arab or Iranian or whatever. This is quite extraordinary. Nowhere else in the world has the U.S. said, we are going to make sure that one party in a regional dispute remains stronger than all the others. And this creates issues that the U.S. hasn't really ever fully uh, uh, dealt with. Uh, but th so that's uh, if that's what I would mention to say, if we then look at value promotion, democracy and human rights, it's not a serious uh, business that the U.S. is doing. I've followed this for the last 50 years, like I said, as a student in the U.S. and working in the Middle East and constantly, and now I'm back in the U.S. in Cambridge and, um, uh, and watching um, uh, developments. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of Americans, uh, as well as people in the Middle East who would, who would question if the US is fully committed to democracy in its own country. If you look at what's going on now with the constitutional issues, voting rights, redistricting, abortion uh, controls, the battle between states and federal government, you, you wonder if democracy is really an, a fully, uh, fully validated system that gives everybody equal rights. It certainly is in the constitution and it certainly is among most of the people in Washington, but not all the people. And then the state level is different. So therefore, I think we should stop talking about US supporting democracy and human rights. What we should talk about is the US and Europe and everybody else who's interested supporting fundamental dignity of life um, and the rule of law. And the people in the Middle East know how to do that. Uh, they've been doing this for thousands of years. Um, so they just have never been given a chance. And this is where the problem, the bigger problem, I think, is the American and European and Russian support for autocratic regimes. Uh, and now you've got also the Israelis doing this, you've got Arab Gulf countries doing this, supporting 
uh, autocrats and trying to hinder democratic uh, transformations. So uh, I think we, we need a, a really serious rethink of what are the links between, if we're looking here at the US mainly, the links between the US and the, and the Middle East, they're from the perspective of people in the region, they're mostly uh, negative, they're mostly destructive, and they're mostly quite uh, frightening. And that's why people drop out, they join militias, they try to immigrate, they swim to Europe, they risk, they risk dying in a boat to Europe because the risk of death in a boat is, is less than the risk of staying in their own country living under autocratic systems and war situations among terrorism and things of that nature. So I think that's, that, that's what I would ask for is a, is a wider rethink uh, of how all these things uh, link, link together. And why is it that the terror groups are continuing to grow in the Sahel, in East uh, Africa, uh, um, uh, all over the region? And presumably the Afghan situation is going to help this a little bit, but I don't think the Taliban are going to go actively hosting Qaeda again. Uh, but we need to understand the foundational drivers, the chronic and growing foundational drivers of a fear and therefore extremist behavior at the level of the family and the individual um, uh, across the region. That's really hard to do um, for people in NATO countries who are used to dealing with dealing, working with autocratic governments and using military uh, um, actions as their main uh, tool. But I think it's, it has to be done. Uh, uh, thanks, Rami. Um, yeah, I, I think to your point about polling and trying to understand sort of the pulse of the people um, on these various issues, um, it's true that the United States continues to sort of lose credibility and support. But then when you dig a little bit deeper with some more granular questions, um, if given a choice, people want to come to the United States with all of the imperfections that we have seen on the democratic front in the last, you know, um, a few years in particular. Um, and, but also, if, if given a choice to, to receive support from um, US organizations such as AID for their own development, they will also take it. So I think it, it, what you're calling for, this reshift of how to do this, um, is, a, is a much bigger question. I'm going to call on Nadia oh, to... Sorry, yeah. second, just one sentence. It's yeah. so clear now, and you see it in Afghanistan, you see it everywhere, the vast majority of people in the MENA region and South Asia share American values, but don't like American foreign policy. That distinction is very clear. So how can we build on it? That's really the big question. Yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you for that. Nadia? Uh, thank you, Rami and Ambassador uh, uh, Jeffrey. So you mentioned something really important, Rami, which is that civil society in the West is fighting for these same values, which is why the solution is civil society to civil society, because Western civil society has phenomenal credibility that hasn't yet been tapped into, and they do want to help. I mean, again, a lot of people, uh, I know at least one of my former students at Kansas State University, she's an American Afghani woman. She served in the US Army and she wants to help make a difference in Afghanistan. So she wants to create some sort of civil. So civil society is the answer more than anything else. So I, I actually have a question that I want to direct to Ambassador Jeffrey. And, uh, and a question you asked uh, Rami, which is why are these groups increasing? In, in these militant groups. So this is just one article in the New York Times about the millions of dollars in support to Taliban. In this instant, uh, Saudi bankroll Taliban, even as King officially supports Afghan government. We see this all over the board. We have allies in the region that pay lip service to us. They are allies, They're, there's definitely real uh, cooperation. But at the same time, they are spilling billions of dollars to essentially support terrorist groups. The Taliban had a sanction in Qatar, as this article indicates, millions of dollars at the same time that you know, there is support for the government. So uh, these regimes may say, oh, well, you know, it's individuals who provide these millions upon millions of dollars to support these ideologies. They are not indigenous to our communities. In fact, in an article by Farah Pandek, 
who was the uh, uh, White House representative to the Muslim world, she detailed, again, people can Google it, she detailed that in 80 Muslim communities she went to, people were complaining about the phenomenal support for these extremist ideologies that are basically with a lot of funding, I mean, funding talks, if we spend billions to create certain ideas, it's gonna make a difference. And these communities all over the Muslim world are suffering from this massive support in, in actual resources. So how can the US fine tune this relationship with, with these allies? Uh, th that is something I think we need to address and we can never make a dent if we don't, you know, th these interesting allies that shake our hands and stab us at the same time. So unless we fine tune this relationship for a long-term vision of stability and democratic rule and nonviolence, I, I don't see a way forward. So I was wondering, since Ambassador uh, uh, Jeffrey has served in so many countries, what he would think of this. Jim, um, I'm going to call on you to uh, first uh, react to both Rami and uh, Nadia and perhaps answer this question, but um, also go back to the question of sort of, are we going to see more regionalism, uh, the sort of the region taking charge and just asking for support? Uh, this is terrific. I really have enjoyed uh, what we've heard. And it's fascinating. It's now uh, we're in the 40th minute of this thing, and we've gone from the American withdrawal to Afghanistan to a forensics of the Middle East and the role of the outside world, beginning with the United States. I hardly know where to begin. Uh, uh, let me start with Nadia. Nadia, you're right. My rule of thumb is uh, nobody's more than 85% your pal in the Middle East. Everybody always cuts their bets and puts a little bit on the other side. Uh, and it's not just in the Middle East. I give you, while it's in the Middle East, it's often seen as certainly as also a NATO and European country, Turkey. Uh, we pull our hair out at Erdogan's uh, playing footsie uh, with the Russians on uh, buying missiles and uh, his economic deals. At the other, on the other hand, uh, he also blocks them militarily in Ukraine, uh, the Caucasus, Libya, and Syria. Uh, the Saudis, uh, we all, they're a special case because we all know the deal from 1979 where the kingdom almost collapsed. Uh, it was a cynical deal. Uh, to survive, they will tilt into their more fundamentalist Islamic elements by helping them internationally. By the same token, if we wanted to have bases, diplomatic support, or other things from the Saudis to then go and smash those movements once they took up arms and started doing terrorism, overthrowing governments that we the Saudis were concerned with, the Saudis had no problem with it. It wasn't that they wanted those movements from uh, Central Asia to the Balkans to succeed, they just wanted to ensure that they didn't experience another attack on the Grand Mosque like 1979, and they've been pretty uh, successful. And we've gone along with that thing, and we, we, we understand the problems. Uh, I give you the Iranians. It was obviously absurd to claim that Iran was behind 9-11, uh, uh, any more than Iraq. But look at the relations between Iran and Al Qaeda. They are significant. They are at various levels. It doesn't mean that Iran is supporting Al Qaeda generally. I would reject that. It does mean that there are various people who have been under house arrest at various times. We know who they are in Iran in a very liberal sense, that, Iran, that Al Qaeda people passed easily through Iran between Afghanistan and Iraq for decades. And there were reasons for that. Iran was hedging its bets too. Germany hedges its bets. Uh, with uh, Nord Stream. That's the way it goes with alliances. Okay. Um, on uh, popular perceptions, uh, Rami, you're right, but I'll start with your criticism, which is absolutely correct, of the United States. We have to move from the idea that democracy is just what we, who are cosmopolitan, Europeans, Americans, to some degree people in the Middle East, in the major cities with um, education sink. It is a constant battle and it goes in various directions. What you have in the United States broadly is, if not two, it's three separate 
struggles in, within two parties over what's most important, uh, identity or practical things. And much of the response in the Republican Party that you pointed to as perhaps uh, problematic for democracy reflects people uh, who feel their identities are being challenged by the modern world, by Washington, by New York, by Wall Street, uh, by universities and such. And to some degree, they're right, even though I find myself in that latter camp uh, challenging those things and they're reacting against it. So let me get to polling in the Middle East. Uh, and this came up all the time when I was either ambassador in Turkey or ambassador in Iraq. Uh, and Washington would keep saying, we've just seen the latest polling. You're down below 10%. Why aren't you making everybody love America? We do so much for Turkey. We do so much. And my answer was, I would then get the polls and we would dig into them. And believe me, we do a lot of polling. We do clandestine polling, real polling and such. Uh, and what we got to was, gee, uh, in those two countries, Iran was down there uh, almost neck and neck with the United States. In fact, most recently in Iraq, we're ahead of Iran in popularity. We may be 15%. And I would say the reason is it's a question of identity. Uh, Israel, which objectively poses, we pose at least a potential threat uh, to regions because we blend into countries. Israel is very careful. If you're a, if somebody in the West Bank or in Gaza, you have every right to believe that Israel is a security threat, but in Yemen or in Algeria, it doesn't make sense. But as an identity issue, Israel and the United States are the manifestations of a militarily powerful outside force that can call the shots potentially or actually involving your country, your people, your identity. That makes it a quote enemy somebody to fear thus even though the iranians are while not arabs and not sunnis they are muslims they're also perceived uh among many of the populations as i said in both iraq and turkey as people they don't want in fact uh, i remember in turkey we said who do they like and it was like borneo it was some country that has absolutely no impact and no potential impact on their identities or on their threats. This doesn't mean this isn't a problem. It just means it's going to be hard to fix this thing because it is hardwired into how cultures uh, come into each other. Um, Marissa, you raised an interesting question that gets to the very core of how to do security in the world. Uh, there is one uh, chain of thought. It has its center in New York, uh, uh, in Turtle Bay at the UN, which is that uh, conflict between nation states groups is the result of bad education, lack of understanding, not enough trust, not enough diplomacy, not working hard enough. The entire European Union was formed on that basis after centuries of horrific wars uh, internecine wars that tore it apart and finally left it a prey to the United States and the Soviet Union in 1945. Uh, it, that kind of thinking has had its successes, the European Union itself, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, and even some of the frozen conflicts. Kofi Annan came within a hair of resolving uh, the Cyprus dispute in 19, uh, rather in 2004 with the Anand plan. So you can use that model, including in conflicts in the region. Where it's hard to use that model is if you're dealing with a predator state, a predator movement, be it terrorist or ideological, that is trying to expand. Uh, and that is uh, where you come into problems. The Middle East has had an easier time dealing with Libya in the past, I would say, 18 months, when it was total chaos with all of these countries pouring in. You had the Saudis, you had the Emiratis, the Turks, the Russians, the Egyptians, uh, the French on the horizon. Uh, and it looked like, you know, it was, it was obviously a chaotic place, yet it has been relatively quiet and there's a real chance that this will get resolved. The same thing with the Eastern Mediterranean disputes of a few months ago. The reason is that there is no major predator state pressing. Russia can play that role, but in Libya, it's still a relatively minor player. It's not in the big leagues uh, and can be uh, balanced by, you know, Egyptian Emirates who are only half in the Russian camps or the Turks working with the UN and the official, quote, 
unquote, government and such. And so those things, you can apply that model very effectively, and we should. It's much of diplomacy. But when you're dealing with a, um, a predator state, when you're dealing with uh, countries that are on the march, it is very, very hard to simply uh, try to find, well, if we only talk together, the Saudis and the Iranians are talking together in Baghdad. That's a good thing from several standpoints, beginning with the reputation of Iraq and its uh, current prime minister. But it's not going to produce any result. And we've heard that from both sides. Again, it's a good thing, but that's not the solution to those things. There are other solutions. The point is where we are having the hardest time resolving problems is where you do have a predator state. That's Lebanon, Yemen, and uh, on the margins, Iraq with uh, Iran, although Iran is limited there, rather like Russia and Libya, you can balance a predator state when, they're, when they're, the prey isn't so much in their clutches. Much different in uh, Lebanon and Yemen and in Syria, where between Russia and Iran, it is, as I discovered, very, very hard to try to get even a reasonable compromise solution. So it all depends on the kind of um, uh, security threat you have. Some of them are resolved by what I would call UN traditional um, uh, diplomatic tools. Others require a strong security component and a recognition that the threat isn't going to go away. The threat can only be contained or deterred because in this world today, uh, you almost never can actually destroy threats. You basically have to live with them and deal with them and try to keep them from becoming more threatening. I'll stop there. Thank you, um, Ambassador uh, Jeffrey. Um, I will now um, go to some of the questions that we've been receiving from our um, viewers. Um, so I'll just read them out here. So the first question, um, and I'll uh, I'll ask the, all panelists to uh, to address um, to address these questions. First question: uh, the power brokers in the Afghanistan region now include Iran, China, Turkey, and Russia, all autocratic regimes. What are the expectations for conflict among the four? Um, would anyone like to jump in or I can, I, Nadia, do you wanna go? I actually, I wanna bring something that hasn't come up that I think should come up. Uh, we're talking about war of ideas, we're talking about interest, and there's an elephant in the room which is misinformation in the digital space and the lack of regulation. So I think we agree that a lot of the challenges that people face are universal. Challenges of civil society to further human rights. They're in the West as well as in the East. And the same thing is true of the lack of, of regulation of all the information technology revolution, which is changing the lives of millions, billions of people really. So uh, how do we regulate that space? H how do we, as you know, the country that invented all these things, or, or, or you know, uh, I think, again, the digital space is where the warfare in soft power and misinformation and interventions um, is where it's gonna be taking place. And, and what we do with that space internally will also determine what we do with it externally. So I just wanted to bring that up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nadia. And that's uh, certainly a space that um, other great powers have been um, using in uh, basically uh, uh, disinformation and misinformation campaigns um, for various political reasons. I'm going to go back to the question again um, about the new sort of power brokers um, uh, in Afghanistan that include Iran, China, Turkey, and Russia. Um, uh, and so what are the expectations for conflict among these four, Rami? Yes, thank you. Um, the fascinating thing about that question is if you look at these powers, Turkey, Iran, China, India, or Pakistan, India, these are four powers that once were global powers. They, at one point in history, they ruled half the known world or whatever. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a difference between countries, countries like those and then smaller countries uh, that are new to the game of regional power balancing. Um, and um, I think what we're going to see 
in Afghanistan as well as in the region is the same thing we've seen for the last uh, around 3,000, 4,000 years, which is powerful countries and smaller vulnerable countries negotiating relationships with each other that serve their mutual interests. And therefore, you're not going to see, a, there's not going to be a clear uh, situation where Afghanistan suddenly is a, a close ally of China or Iran. They're all going to, these are, these are sophisticated and nuanced um, societies, cultures. Um, they're not very good, some of them, at managing contemporary governance in many ways. Uh, the, they're mostly autocratic, and, but th that's a separate point. But they know how to deal with regional and global uh, powers. And I think what you're going to see is a continuous nonstop negotiation among these different groups uh, to get the most advantageous position that they can for their own strategic interests. But they know that they can't act as Jim called it, predator states. They can't go in there and say, we're going to dictate. Um, uh, so I think we're going to watch a lot of uh, talking, discussions, movements, jockeying for position, limited uh, strategic agreements uh, without any one external party being the main uh, player in, um, in Afghanistan. The last point I'd make is, this, this, the, the two most important elements in the MENA region, which I think applies to South Asia to a large extent, um, uh, are that you have the emergence of regional powers now that, mm -hmm. that, that actively get involved openly and quietly uh, in regional conflicts. So with Turkey, Iran, uh, Israel, the Emiratis, uh, Egypt is trying to get back into that game, not doing very well. So regional powers now have a huge influence on other states. And the second thing is the emergence of non-state actors and non-state armed actors. So you've got groups like the Ansarullah in Yemen, Hezbollah, the, um, uh, uh, the, the Iranian-linked um, forces in uh, Iraq, uh, the Kurdish groups in the north of Syria and, um, and Iraq. So these are huge new players, some of whom, like Hezbollah, are stronger than uh, the states in they live in and around them. So I think there's going to be a continuous uh, give and take uh, until there's a sort of a stability where the key determinant is going to be that nobody threatens the strategic interests of the other. And, and therefore, the def defining one strategic interest, real national interest, uh, has to be the number one priority for all of these countries. And also, I think, is a good uh, uh, yardstick for the U.S. to use and other foreign powers. Now, what is their real strategic interest uh, in the region? And I'll have more to talk say about that later. Thanks, Rami. Jim, you want to weigh, up, weigh in on this question of the four briefly, new Rami, players? Rami did a brilliant job describing it. Uh, what I want to do is not try to challenge it, because he's absolutely right, in fact, <clears throat> uh, uh, state that it, this is going to be uh, a Petri dish for what happens when you remove that major international player for the last 80 years, the United States, from the equation. Because other than some minor over-the-horizon counterterrorism stuff, and I think there's less there than people think um, in terms of what we can do, it's going to be exactly as you described. But I also lived through exactly that from 1991 to 1995 in the Balkans, where the United States under two administrations decided it wasn't going to play and it would be up to the Europeans. And we had then uh, on the margins, Russia, but very much so Turkey, various European states with different interests and a whole variety of local actors, including sub-state actors, uh, the Kosovo Albanians, the uh, Bosnia uh, Serbiaks and on and on, uh, uh, running around amok. And that, of course, is the problem. It is a classic 19th century game, uh, but it, 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 which, of course, two of the places that the 19th century game was most played were in the Balkans and the Northwest frontier, i.e. Afghanistan, Pakistan. The problem is it leads to 
awful situations for the populations who become the victims of all of these powers jostling around trying to figure out what their interests are and arming different groups and such. It's pretty chaotic and it's pretty unpleasant. That's one of the reasons why we tried to move beyond this after 1945. But in Afghanistan, you're absolutely right, Remy, we're going to be back to this. And uh, these countries do not all have the same interests. Uh, normally, particularly Russia and China can mobilize against whatever the United States is doing. We see China's ridiculous support for Russia on Syria uh, as a good example of that, whereas China has no real interest in Syria. But uh, with the United States out of the equation, uh, uh, watch that spot. Thanks, Jim. Um, second question that came in from the audience, uh, how are Middle Eastern countries planning to engage with the Taliban, with this Taliban government? What steps have they taken or they plan to take to deal with the looming humanitarian crisis that is basically faces the people of Afghanistan, food, electricity, um, host, um, housing shortages, especially in view of the approaching harsh winter. Um, Nadia, do you want to tackle this? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So how are they going to deal with Taliban? You know, I am a little bit of a, a news junkie, so I watch various networks because that is how public opinion in part is shaped, right? All the media in the Middle East pretty much is supported by government. So you know where the government is roughly by what is the, what is the, the messages. Including the pan-Arab channels, right? Absolutely. I mean, especially the pan-Arab channels, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, um, uh, even our own Al Hurra. And this is where I think, so how are they gonna treat Taliban? Just look, watch their news. Basically they're celebrating the victory of Taliban how this is a defeat like in Vietnam. No mention that actually after the so-called defeat in Vietnam, the US went on to be a superpower, went on to lead the world in innovation, creating the internet. I mean, in every way, in every sector, even leading the world in Olympics and in every way, the, the US went on to do the Soviet Union, to, I'm sorry, defeat the Soviet Union. So. So this is hardly a, a defeat for the US. This is a, a defeat for its image maybe, but in actuality, how, it, how the US was impacted by this, it, it's more sentimental in some ways, in some ways. So this is why it's really important that Al-Hurra especially, I really believe it has an important role to play still, but other networks that, are, that have space to be more objective, that they cover that this government is completely failing, is incapable of, of governing, it's a lot easier to destroy something than to build. They're very good at destroying Islamic, all Islamic factions have proven their ability to destroy. Because you can just walk into a mall and kill people. I mean, that is, it doesn't take a lot of genius, but to actually build something, to create something that the whole world can benefit from is a whole different story. So, uh, they will continue, I believe, to support Taliban. And this is why we need to continue to actually counter that message in, pub in shaping public opinion uh, and an actual support from our, our own civil society to their civil society. Rami, do you want to weigh on, uh, we, uh, in on this as well, um, uh, not just in, in terms of how the governments will engage with the Taliban, um, but also how will they or will they also pitch in to address the humanitarian crisis that is um, looming. You're talking of the American government or Arab no, government? No, governments in the region, in the Middle region. Eastern countries, yes. How will well, they re react? Uh, I think everybody's gonna wait a little bit to see what happens. Um, you know, most of this talk in the US, which I follow very closely and in Europe at the same time, which focuses heavily on, uh, on women and girls' education, which I 100% support. Uh, but this is, this is not the major strategic issue that countries are going to use to determine how they deal with the, uh, with the Taliban. I think these kinds of um, um, advocacy, which again, I totally support, uh, but they're more designed to make Americans feel good than they are to actually create a new strategic relationship in the region. It's like people in, in the US, including Barack Obama and others, talked about promoting democracy and human rights in the Arab world. They didn't really 
want to do that. They didn't really care about ordinary Arab people. They cared about their image as the purveyor uh, of these uh, values. So I think if you look at the situation inside Afghanistan, most people are going to wait. Uh, there is intense pressure on the Taliban to be more uh, amenable to women working and girls' education. There's signs of that. Uh, hopefully, it'll continue. It's going to have to evolve at a pace that is acceptable to the people in Afghanistan. You know, there's terrible stuff going on in Burma. Um, and there's terrible stuff going on in North Korea and other places in the world uh, where, where dictatorships work. Um, and we, we can't address all of these. We have to strategically look at what is good for the people there and hope that their governments will do it. And what impacts us, whether in the Middle East or the US or Europe or wherever uh, we are. My uh, analysis uh, over the recent years has been that the Middle East is uh, has lost its strategic importance to the US. Other than terrorism and uh, mass migration to Europe, um, which are the big cutting issues for Western powers, uh, oil is not an issue. Israel safety is not an issue. Therefore, the Middle East is not strategically important. It is the first disposable region in the annals of Western uh, diplomacy. As Somalia was the first disposable country when it started to fall apart in the 1980s. And, and today we've had Iraq, we've had Libya, we've had Yemen, we've had Lebanon now, many countries falling apart and people don't particularly care. Even if they're all countries like Libya, that doesn't, the world can live with these things. So our strategic importance as a region is not serious for the world anymore. Uh, though it could become a problematic region if things get much, much worse and you get more terrorism or cutting trade routes or whatever. Uh, that, that, that I mentioned that uh, because people are going to look at Afghanistan more realistically now. They've learned from the last uh, 20 years. They learned from Vietnam. They learned from Iraq. And maybe they haven't learned everything, but I think there's a more rational attitude among uh, Western officials. Uh, among Western publics, these are, uh, you know, number 10 on the list of what people care about. So there's not going to be any public uh, pressure for these issues. And therefore, people are going to wait and see what the Taliban are doing, try to have good relations uh, mutually uh, without being seen to be supporting terrorists or uh, repressing women. And that's how, that's how countries do foreign foreign relations. The United States is still learning. You know, U.S. is a very young country. It's still learning how to do diplomacy. The U.S. has historically looked at the world as markets or targets, markets to get commodities from or sell things to, and targets uh, to, to attack militarily or to do counterterrorism militarily. So I think now they're realizing we're more than just targets or markets, that we are living societies with different views within our societies and dangers that come out of our societies in the form of armed groups, terrorist groups, mass migration, cutting off uh, trade, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm sensing more sophistication, uh, more realism in, in, the, in the United States. Uh, it's still though heavily influenced by uh, Israel and the Iran situation disproportionately uh, influenced. And, and that is slowly going to uh, change, I would guess. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Rami. I'm, I'm going to ask the third question because it's very much related to the second question with regards to um, regional governments. Um, many countries in the region um, have been part of or have, had, have um, uh, played an influential role um, in Afghanistan, Qatar is one. Um, but with regards to the Afghan peace talks, they had um, hosted the Taliban and the peace talks um, so much that other actors uh, such as the United Arab Emirates also started competing to host negotiations in order perhaps to counter the image that Qatar tried to create as a regional mediator. This is what uh, the question I'm reading. So the, the two part tied question here to this um, statement is, do you expect this regional competition between these countries continuing with the um, Afghan context after uh, Taliban's takeover? Uh, do you expect Qatar's role in Afghanistan to fuel accusations of support of terrorism against that country? Uh, but it really does go back to the original question of well, how are these countries in the region, primarily players that are involved in um, Afghanistan, uh, how will they continue? 
deal with with the new reality in Afghanistan. Jim, gonna tap you for this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit cynic. I, I see that uh, the country is most engaged from the region in uh, Afghanistan, leaving for the moment Turkey aside, uh, the Emiratis and the UAE. Uh, it was the Afghanistan policy was a subset of their within the Arab world and more specifically GCC policies and their relations with the United States, to be honest. With the United States out, uh, I think that uh, there'll be less interest in engaging. Uh, Turkey sees itself more as a um, uh, regional power in a way that the Emiratis and the Qataris do not see themselves. And uh, Afghanistan has been a long standing uh, Turkish interest going back uh, for much of the 20th century. So, and the Turks had a very strong military and diplomatic presence there during the NATO period. So uh, <clears throat> with, with the, the Turks I would put in the same category as uh, say, if the first tier is Russia, China, and Pakistan, the Turks along with India uh, are going to be the second tier. I don't see Middle Eastern countries as anything other than a far removed third tier in terms of what's going to happen in uh, Afghanistan, because the core national and military interests of most of these countries, with the exception of Turkey, are on the ground in Afghanistan. They have access to the country directly, or in the case of India, indirectly. And they also have deep pockets when it comes to their security concerns that will allow them to balance whatever dollars or rubles or whatever are flowing around from the Gulf. Thanks, Jim. Um... Next question was, is, is focused on the US um, military basis and the US will use military bases in the Middle East for counterterrorism in Afghanistan. What does this mean for the relations between the US and um, these countries where the bases are located? Um, what does it mean for public opinion in these countries? We've talked about public opinion um, already here, um, but also for extremist groups. I see Rami, you're very eager to answer this. Go ahead. Well, it's a good, it's an important question. And I think it's important to start by saying that there is a legitimate use of force by the US, by foreign powers, and by local governments to do counterterrorism. It's not absolutely use power. So you know, getting the Iraqis out of Kuwait was legitimate. Defeating ISIS, which was done by local people as well as US air power, that was legitimate. Um, beyond that, uh, I mean, getting Qaeda hit in 2000 and one in Afghanistan was seen to be legitimate. Uh, so, uh, but those cases are, uh, are limited. Uh, I think people are gonna judge the US or any foreign power that militarily is involved in the region, judge them by what they're doing. Uh, if it's seen to be something that is useful for the security of those societies in the Middle East, then people will go along with it. They just don't want to see an initial military exercise uh, transform into a long-term uh, chaotic uh, situation which breeds corruption and, and counter-terrorism and, and, and new forms of terrorism, which is what we had in Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan, uh, both with heavy, heavy American uh, involvement. I think the U.S. has probably learned these lessons, uh, but again, it depends a lot. Uh, it's going to depend a lot on how much the Iranian situation and Israeli and pro-Israeli forces influence American policy, which we know they've done heavily over the years, that influence hopefully will be reduced and Americans will look at their interests much more stringently and carefully. Uh, and they'll use military force when it's necessary. And that's how people are, are going to judge them. Thank you, Rami. Um, uh, Nadia or uh, Jim, do you want to um, tackle this aspect of it particularly uh, the Nadia, maybe the public opinion piece, um, what extremist groups may think and how will how they will use that um, as um, as part of their narrative that oh the re the region is full of military bases and um, you know seeing that as a, as a driver to recruit, for example. Uh, you know, this is an old story that has been used and exploited and people did used to get behind it, but I'm not sure they would anymore. I mean, again, uh, like like uh, uh, both Rami and Ambassador Jeffrey just said that 
there's a sort of a realism that people, a hard won realism that even if there is militaries on the ground, that doesn't mean that ISIS is the solution. That in fact, these, these extremist groups have anything to offer the region except for terror. So I, I really think that lesson has soaked with the majority of people. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I, the reason why a lot of these terrorist groups are expanding, even though they are you know, definitely a small percentage, but a small percentage can do phenomenal damage, is that again, they, they do have resources. I mean, without resources, these extremist groups cannot go far and weapons and all, uh, these are very expensive resources. So why don't we try to dry out these resources? And the second thing is like Rami said, you know, if it wasn't for the active military interference of the US, ISIS was taking over parts of Iraq and Syria, forming its own country and terrorizing entire populations. So there is a legitimate use of force. Our so-called ally will continue to allow spaces to shape public uh, uh, opinion against the US. But I think this is why we need also to use our own platforms like Al Hurra, like many other platforms to counter these messages and show with facts how this is not true. Uh, thanks, Nadia. Ambassador Jeffrey. Sure, uh, we're, we're, we're actually not going too far afield. This is an important point. As one who's been on the ground getting permissions to do things from bases, I can tell you every country in the region that has American bases, this is not gonna be a popular thing to say either for the governments and maybe some of the people, has absolute eyes on at least to the general what we're doing and can stop it in a heartbeat if that government wants it. 1985, Turkey blocked the use of the 401st uh, F-16 fighter wing at Inchilic Air Base from intervening in the TWA hijacking by threatening Syria. 1996, Kuwait of all countries, when Saddam, some of you will remember, uh, mobilized forces in support of Barzani against uh, Talibani and retook Erbil, his first major military operation since seizing Iraq, since Kuwait. Uh, we mobilized a brigade to reinforce uh, Kuwait. Kuwait delayed a day before giving us permission to make the point that it wasn't happy that this was announced publicly in Washington before the Kuwaitis had said yes. This is my experience day in and day out in the region. It's real clear. If we're going off to bomb terrorists, everybody is happy because governments see the benefits of it and there's not much popular opposition. If we want to go off and bomb Iran from a base anywhere in the Gulf, the answer is, and it's been this way for over a decade, are you crazy? Look what they're going to do to us if uh, you, we, hit, uh, we allow you to hit them out of our country. This, this is a major complication for American uh, strategic planning, frankly. I mean, this is really interesting because, um, you know, we, I follow uh, what columnists and, and what, you know, social media says about all of this, or people on social media engage on new military agreements or bases. Um, and there's initial uh, criticism, of course, um, by the people. Why should we be housing um, uh, America, the American military? What does this say? Um, about us or our sovereignty, there are all these different questions pop up. But then when you ask these same people about their concerns um, uh, or their support for the military in their own countries, um, security continues to be um, um, a number one concern for them and support for the security establishment or the military, and we can look at polling, continues to be much higher than their support of, of governments, right? So, so this is um, sort of, uh, as as Nadia said, perhaps it's a it's an old narrative um, that keeps on playing in different in different ways. Rami, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I want to follow up on something uh, that Nadia mentioned, which is really important and 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 fits into a lot of what we talk about. Like governments in the region, like non-state actors, like foreign governments, they're all evolving now. They're recalculating. So have the terrorist groups. And one of the really important developments of the last, I would say eight, 10 years uh, has been the groups like uh, 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 Qaeda, Shabab, some of the groups in, 
uh, local groups in, in Syria and Idlib and that area where they're now concentrated uh, in Yemen. These groups are looking now more carefully at how they can generate legitimacy for themselves among local populations where they might be in power if they took power militarily they realize mm -hmm. now that they can't perpetuate their incumbency or their rule purely by military force so the first thing isis did when they created their so-called state was they made sure the bakeries were open 24 hours the people in the uh, terror movements uh, understand that legitimacy, the link between local populations and the rulers is critical uh, for enduring. And I think the Taliban are going to get the same uh, situation pertaining. They're going to understand that they can't just rule by force. They've got to, and they have much more challenging uh, humanitarian socioeconomic conditions in Afghanistan. So I think we need to watch the uh, let's call them the radical extremist militants, Islamist militants. Uh, some are terrorists, some are just radical extremists. How they evolve to continue to try to generate legitimacy rather than rule by uh, by force. It'll be also equally interesting to see how um, Islamist groups in the region are watching that situation um, in Afghanistan and how the Taliban will evolve um, as necessary. Uh, there are a few other questions that I'm going to try to sum up because we, we I want to have some time for um, one key takeaway from each one of you. Um, so one question that came in through the Middle East programs portal. Um, uh, is it possible for civil society actors in the humanitarian community to target vulnerable Afghans without having to work through the Taliban? Nadia? So, uh, I do believe it is. Like I said, we have had at least a year of education, legitimate education through online spaces. So, uh, I think that it's important for the US and other countries that are giving Taliban aid in order to keep the country going, that they make a contingent upon the right to have inform access to information, the internet, because again, the Taliban needs these other countries to continue to function. Otherwise they have a civil war all over and that will not bode well for what they've done for the country. I mean, their, their popularity would only sink if the country, because of what they did, descended after 20 years of semi-stability, 20 years of people participating, all sectors of society, all of a sudden, because of what they pulled off, people are suffering, the country is in civil war, the country is descending into chaos, poverty, insecurity because of them. So they have an invested interest to actually allow, you know, some room for negotiation. So I do think that right now, I mean, they can't even stop it if they want it, they can't bring back people to the to the dark ages everybody has a cell phone again we, we do have means uh, uh, western countries do have means to enable that digital space and i do think this is where most of the work will be done and we have to think long term not just short term i mean how long does it take to earn a degree how long does it take to build a human being i mean it takes a lot longer than than to kill people so we have to really be patient and think, like you said, have strategic patience as we invest in rooting these values. Thanks, Nadia. Um, one last question, and then we'll, we'll go quickly to final thoughts. Um, given the impact and speed of what is happening now and likely to happen in Afghanistan from economic pressions and decline, um, humanitarian suffering, growing terrorist activity, uh, migration, do outside countries, um, including countries in the Middle East and North Africa region, have time to wait? I'm going to start with you, um, Ambassador Jeffrey. Uh, in terms of some kind of solution in Afghanistan, they have plenty of time to wait because nobody thinks that they have a way to really influence what's going on there. Uh, Nadi has indicated that there are ways through uh, uh, social media, and she's right. Uh, but nonetheless, that isn't a, uh, a government action plan, typically. Uh, it's the action plan of other civil society groups who will be active. Uh, again, uh, you have a set of powers who see their existential interests involved 
in Afghanistan who now are in the driver's seat and they aren't shy about using classic hard power to achieve their results. Nobody's going to get in the way of that if the United States isn't and the United States and its European allies obviously will not. In terms of the larger region, I think that, uh, uh, again, uh, we're in a better place now than we were two months ago. People are calmer about what has happened in Afghanistan. The administ Biden administration has done a pretty good job reassuring everybody who's, who's charged to Washington from all of our key regional allies uh, to talk to us that uh, we're not leaving the region. And uh, I think that people will probably see Afghanistan as a one-off uh, more than it is something that indicates the future of the United States and the region. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey. Rami? Um, yeah, I think uh, there is uh, time. I think people, uh, Ambassador Jim is correct, that people are more calm. They're, they, they, they've, you know, this is the second time they have to deal with Afghanistan, and they're much more realistic. They're much more uh, aware of the limits of both foreign intervention, whether positively, if you're trying to promote civil society and democracy and women's rights or environmental, and they're much more aware of the limits of military power, despite the enormous uh, technical advantages that the US has, there's limits to that uh, power. Um, and the uh, issue of stability in these countries and legitimacy of governance and quality of governance Will, will require some time, probably a year or two, to, to clarify themselves. Um, I am convinced across the Middle East, and I'm sure it's the same in Afghanistan, even though I've never been there, but I'm sure it's, this is human nature, that ordinary people will put up with hardships in jobs, income, whatever, if they see better days coming ahead. People by nature are relatively patient and realistic. If they don't see better days coming ahead, they will revolt, they will rebel. We've seen it so many times. In, or leave. In, pardon? Or, or leave. try to leave, yeah. Leave uh, yeah. if they can. Um, so, the, but the, the, the pressures on all these societies because of population growth, water shortages, environmental distress, and now climate change is, is overshadowing uh, everything. I think the idea of global competition uh, is less intense now than it was uh, certainly when I was in college in the 60s and 70s. Yes, China has risen as an economic power, but China does not want to do great political feats around the world, at least uh, not yet. So I'm much more hopeful. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rami. Um, so we have time for one quick sort of takeaway from each one of you. Uh, I think my takeaway was that as much as we try to um, uh, to sort of limit the conversation to the implications of what's happening in Afghanistan um, uh, on the Middle East, the conversation always veers towards, well, let's talk about the root causes of, of, what's, uh, of, of what we see um, in the region. And I think that's um, quite unique about um, the Middle East and how, um, and sort of reinforces the notion that it will continue to be um, uh, at the core of um, developments worldwide because it's it 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 stays very central to U.S. Um, uh, national security. So one final thought from each one of you, um, keeping in mind uh, sort of the discussion that we had and the first question that we kicked off um, uh, with, um, and that is how do we see things playing out in the region um, uh, in light of developments um, in Afghanistan? Nadia, I'm going to start with you. Thank you. Marissa, I think it's very clear to all of us that there is a tension, if not outright war, between the forces of authoritarianism and the forces that want to see more democratic practices, accountable governance, human rights. And these forces, one side is unleashing all of its weapons, money, uh, spyware, every weapon at its disposal. And we, I like to believe all of us are on the side of wanting to see more human rights, more stability, more sound governance. We also, and those who are on our side, we need to be very proactive. We cannot afford to just sit and just hope that the legitimacy of human rights, the legitimacy of stability and, and sound governance will by itself survive without any help from outside. We have to be proactive. Thank you. 
Thanks, Nadia. Uh, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, uh, in the on the security portfolio, uh, United States coming to the rescue is not going to be taken for granted, particularly in a period after this, just as it wasn't taken for granted after Vietnam. On the other hand, people aren't going to rule it out. What they're going to do is to see what the Biden administration does in concrete cases. Does it pivot its forces out of the region? Does it, you know, who does it talk to? Who travels to the region? Who does President Biden meet on his uh, uh, trips abroad? So far in the last two months, they've done a really good job of reinforcing the fact they want to stay in the Middle East and be a player. And that's good. We'll see if it continues. But these are all easy. This is 45 minutes with, you know, the difficult President Erdogan and that kind of thing. That's very different than a real crisis. It was very different than what they had to do uh, with Gaza a few months ago. So we'll see how they do. Uh, in terms of the American Democratic agenda, uh, There'll be a certain amount of cynicism, both in the region and in Washington, about the ability of the United States as a state to do that. U.S. actors through social media, through uh, voluntary actions and other things will continue to play perhaps an even greater role. But nobody is going to expect the United States <clears throat> to put this at the top of the agenda because we've done sufficient damage to the security side of our overall uh, regional role that that'll have uh, a primary focus uh, for the months ahead. Thank you, Ambassador Jeffrey. Rami. Yeah, I think a couple of things that um, we should pay attention to. My guess is we're going to see much more involvement in Afghanistan by international groups, whether uh, governmental uh, like the UN or uh, independent uh, international big. Uh, INGOs that deal with humanitarian uh, and other issues, they seem to have a little bit more legitimacy than individual countries going in and trying to uh, help out. Um, second of all, I think the, the fundamental um, criterion that we should look for and try to promote if we can in Afghanistan is the rule of law. Uh, the rule of law doesn't have to be Western democracy. You could have rule of law under Islamic Sharia, uh, as long as it's the rule of law that is accepted by the people and treats all people uh, with dignity and with equal rights as they define it. So we have to be humble in this situation. Uh, uh, tribal law, Islamic law, constitutional law, international law, there's many kinds of law uh, and they are only important insofar as they are legitimate in the eye of the beholder, the people who live under that law. And that's what I uh, I'm looking for uh, very much in Afghanistan. And thirdly, I'd say it's, it's positive that people are a little bit more mature and more relaxed about what's going on in Afghanistan. There's a lot of conflicts all over the world. There's suffering people all over the world. Uh, they're gonna, those problems are generated locally and have to be mostly locally resolved. Uh, and, and, and since this is the second time around for the Taliban, I'm expecting them to, to be different than they were the first time, uh, but we'll wait and see. And finally, I would I disagree with both my um, colleagues and friends. I would not pay any attention to social media. I would not pay any attention to columnists. Uh, me having been both of those things, uh, I think they, you know, the, the media has become an entertainment, commercial, um, ideological business, and I've spent my whole life in the media. I, I think it's a, it's a good way to get a feel for what people are thinking, but the problem with social media and columnists uh, is that they're heavily influenced by ideological forces. They uh, are home to a lot of nutcases and extremists, and they're more entertainment than knowledge based. So we need to watch them, learn from them, but not use them as a primary lens to understand what is going on in the world. Uh, Rami, you just gave us a, a great topic for another panel discussion. <laughs> Thank you um, so much uh, to all of you, to um, Rami Khoury, uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, and Nadia Redat for um, a truly fascinating discussion on um, the implications of um, what's happening in Afghanistan on the Middle East and North Africa region, um, and uh, but also um, very much 
um, on uh, uh, U.S. MENA relations um, as well. Um, thanks to uh, my colleague, Michael Kugelman uh, from the Asia program uh, for co-hosting this program today. Thanks to the AV team for constantly uh, making sure that everything runs so smoothly. Um, and thanks, thanks to both teams at the Asia program and MEP for everything that they've done for today. Um, thanks to all of you for watching and we hope to continue the conversation very soon.